Hey everyone and welcome back to the Secret Sunday Session podcast. Today we have Jen, Dr. Jen Amar on with us today and today we're going to be hearing about Jen's story, um, her recovery and her ongoing recovery with her eating disorder as well as what she is currently doing in the space, what she has done in the space and what sort of voice she has found now and is being able to implement in this in the space to help other people and to create awareness. Something that um, I know I am very passionate about so I'm very excited to have Jen on to to share the passion so welcome Jen thank you so much for jumping on. Hi thank you it's um super exciting to jump on here with you obviously we've had some conversations up to now so it's um yeah I'm super happy to be here. Yeah and I'm grateful even the way that we were able to connect and if anyone who's listening was in attendance of our uh, ladies lunch in 2023 Jen was actually a speaker there and we got to hear a little bit about her story and she got to share some of her insights of what she's learned through her journey. And I just knew from that moment that I met you that our relationship was not only going to be one of just shared passions, but also just connection because I knew in in, with speaking with you that through our journeys that we'd shared so much in common, but also had come out of it and just wanted to be able to teach people and to be able to share with others what can be accomplished if you do pursue recovery. And I think that is one of the things that I love when I meet people that have been through an eating disorder, that they come out the other side and they want to share what they've been through because I know there are so many stigmas attached to kind of silencing yourself once you've gone through something because of the trauma, which is completely valid to anyone who is going through an eating disorder or has gone through that, but it also can feel very isolating. So I'm very grateful that you have been willing as well in your journey to share what you have been through and start that conversation with us and even share the passion that we have here at The Secret Burden. And I think that as much as I know a lot about you and your story, and some of you may know a little bit about Jen's story out there, for those people that don't know who you are, who is Jen and what is she doing with herself today? Oh, so who am I? Um, I always love this question because you always tend to go to an identity about who you are. Mm. And you realise actually you're so many things, um, whether that's being a sister, a mum, a daughter, a, a lawyer, a writer, a recovery warrior, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, but what am I? Um, so... I'm currently, I recently just completed a PhD um, and my PhD was um, stemmed from my personal experience. So I looked at eating disorder prevention in athletes um, as a former athlete myself. And I was very fortunate to work with Swimming Australia where I was building educational interventions for coaches and athletes, which really centered around looking at language behaviors and the culture that was being created, which was placing our athletes at risk of um, eating disorders, but also knowing what to do when we identify an athlete at risk, whether you're a coach, whether you're another athlete who's concerned about a friend, um, how do we broach this topic? Um, And so really equipping them with the skills and the confidence to know what to say, when to say it, what to look out for and what's your role in um, what you have identified. And I guess that's probably one little part, but I do have kind of on the side of that, I share my story um, in as many ways as I can. Um, And I guess the way I share my story is often just quite raw and it's shared when I feel called to share. Um, And sometimes that might be, I will need to blog something on my social media Um, And there's no timing to that. I don't have scheduled posts. It's literally when I feel called to share something about my story, when I feel like I want to help, when I feel like I want to provide some light for somebody who might need it, um, I go on and I share. Um, I'm now in a few different roles. So I am off the back of my PhD. I'm working for a mental health organization. still in kind of a research role, um, really working in that preventative space. Um, But I'm also writing some eating disorder education content still within the sports world. 
Um, and then, yeah, hopefully doing a little bit of project work with you guys in the future. Mm, I love that. And, you know, of course, we do mention that this has stemmed from your own diagnosis and recovery from an eating disorder. If we go back to those moments when you were diagnosed, do you remember why or even how you started developing symptoms of an eating disorder? Yeah, so it's um it's really interesting. I can actually remember the very moment when things happened in my life, which is, and it's so clear in my mind. Um, and so I often say, as a as a young child, I was a high achiever, a perfectionist. Um, I excelled in school, in sport, in everything I did. And I think from a very young age, I learned to validate my being um, from external validation from others. Um, and that made me feel good enough and made me feel like I belong. Uh, and when I moved to secondary school, I was put into a very pressurizing environment where there was girls who were all of a sudden doing better than me in, in school. Um, in sport, in class, and it was the first time I'd ever experienced um, not feeling good enough, not feeling like I was worthy. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with those emotions as a young girl. Um, and I remember being sat in the canteen at one of the break times, um, and I had like one of these little cereal bars as my snack. Um, and one of my friends picked up the wrapper and she looked at the back and I was so, so naive and I asked her what she was reading. Um, and she said, I'm looking at how many calories are in this. Um, and my 12 year old little self asked her what calories were. Um, and I got her perspective on um, what's healthy, what's not healthy and how I should eat. And from that day, I pursued that. Um, and it started with this innocent call to eat a little bit healthier. Um, and after a short period of time, that wasn't enough. So I would cut certain foods out and then more foods. And then it spiraled. And I guess those behaviours were used as a way to numb the emotions of not feeling good enough. Um, and I always really like to get that point across because I think that's really a big misunderstanding around eating disorders. Um, people see the symptoms, people see the behaviours, but they don't see where the actual root is. Um, and it takes a long time, I think, for us to peel back the layers and actually realise um, that feeling of inadequacy, feeling of not being worthy of belonging, acceptance, really does tend to be where we see a lot of these problems stem from. It's so sad and I can resonate so much in how it starts so innocently and it starts by a single comment or a single person just talking about calories and from there it's like an open portal to start your triggered journey through an eating disorder and I think that's where it's really hard these days is because that conversation is so glamorized it's so normalized to the point where if you're not talking about calories then you're not looking after your health if you're not losing weight then you're not healthy. And I think that's where the messaging is almost wrong because if that's being fed to a 12-year-old, that's not right, especially a 12-year-old of an unsound mind that is just looking for validation from an external world. So how did you find that, you know, when you started out and it just started innocently, as you said, it was just cutting out this and cutting out that and being more aware was there any point where you thought, I'm actually, this is not right, like this is wrong, I'm actually stepping into unhealthy territory? Um, no, I didn't. Um, it was, I always express it as it was almost like you have two minds um, and your eating disorder controls one part of your mind and then you have the other. But um, it really was driven by this eating disorder voice that was in my head, I would say. Um, and so whatever I was doing was reaffirmed by that voice. Um, and it was almost like your brain was warped very, very quickly into believing that this was all okay. 
Um, and if there was any attempts to interrupt your behaviours, um, I became quite malicious and spiteful. Like I, I turned from a very outgoing, um, loving, sweet, funny, kind young girl who um, became very malicious and spiteful and secretive um, throughout that illness whenever there was any sort of people trying to help um, and you didn't want them to help because that would disrupt your behaviours. So um, there was this character that developed, um, which you feel quite resentful about, but um, even though you know it wasn't your fault, um, there's a lot of things that happen over the years which you feel really resentful about in terms of pushing loved ones and friends and family away. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about that character tra change and a lot of people I think don't understand that that is what comes with an eating disorder, especially in that form, is that very distinct character traits that start to step in that are no longer your true self. How do you express that to other people that this is no longer someone that who they were before this is now someone that is almost taken over by a mental illness how do you describe that to someone or tell that to someone when a lot of people as we mentioned before only know eating disorders as the person who's anorexic that loses a certain amount of weight goes on a diet and ideally it just fails them yeah um, it's a really good point and um, I think they are some of the illnesses that the most difficult to understand, um, even for the person going through it, let alone people who are on the sidelines trying to help and trying to understand. Um, the simplest way I could find to explain it um, was to give it a name and to literally describe it like another person that had inhabited that human being almost. Um, I actually named mine Anna, so in the name of anorexia. So um, that was the voice that lived in my head and that was the voice that was controlling my behaviours, what I would say, what I would do. Um, and I, I share that with people who are supporting loved ones because I think it's really important that they understand that so that they don't lose hope that they haven't lost their child or they haven't lost their friend, they will come back um, and they need them there. And as hard as it is, every time they're pushing that person away to stay there, to be there and to know that this isn't them. This is an illness which is consuming them, but they will come back and they will come back faster with you being there. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand how hard that is um, having seen sort of it happen in my own family um, and how it can it can tear families apart. And I happened to lose, I lost all of my friends essentially during that time. Um, and I think I don't blame those friends at all because we were very young um, and for them to try and even comprehend what was happening um, I would not expect that of a, of, a, of a young girl and they did try um, they tried to invite me to things they tried to help but um, yeah there was um, a lot of barriers that I put up um, and after several years there was just element of by default I was just losing that connection with that group of friends um, but yeah I think the easiest way is to literally describe it as another person that inhabits somebody um, give it a name, express how it is expressing itself in that person um, because it then almost becomes separate from that person. You know, they are not their eating disorder. They are experiencing an eating disorder. Um, mm. And I think I really like to differentiate that because I think that language is so important. Um, an eating disorder can so quickly become someone's identity um, where it's, it, it's them and that's who they know as themselves and I think it's really important that we have this language where we say no you are not your eating disorder you are experiencing this but you are so much more than that and even that language itself just offers a glimmer of hope um when you kind of separate the two mm. and I think for the person going through it as well 
it's I remember going through my recovery and I never could name it because I just always thought like it was me it was my voice and then going out of recovery and sort of understanding it from a different perspective once you gain more weight and you've got more of a sound mind could actually see that you were almost inhibited by someone else like someone else did take over and in identifying that you then realize that the thoughts in your head the ones that popped in and talked about weight and talked about restriction and binging and purging and and all the rest it made it feel like you were not crazy and it made you feel like that you weren't this sick human being it made you just feel like that as you said you were just experiencing an eating disorder and I sometimes like to look at it as it for some reason whatever reason Anna she chose me like she chooses many but she chose me to take host of my body and if I change that perspective in going this is not who I am it made recovery easier as well to choose it because then I wasn't always questioning, well, who am I without my eating disorder if my eating disorder is me? Whether if you are just experiencing it, as you said, then it's just you're just fighting to get to be stronger than that ED voice and to be more powerful than Anna. And I love that language so much. I think that it should be, as you said, push so much. And if it, you don't think it, it works for you, just just try it. Um, just keep at it nothing works once Um, you just have to keep at it and I think it's important as well and I don't know in your journey when you sort of remember the point when your character changed because I think there is a point as we mentioned that it goes on quite innocent and you're just being quite healthy and you're just looking after yourself and sometimes that's just that's just normal but do you remember a point or do you remember even people telling you when there was a point where that character did start to the character traits did start to tap tap in and you were almost taken over yeah I I think it happened pretty early um so it was around 12 13 um and I remember being called out on certain behaviors and being very aggressive um and being very secretive and manipulative in those behaviors and that happened very early on um and it was so bizarre how you touched on this earlier how that didn't seem abnormal to me um it happened so quickly where that was just that was what I did and there was no questions there was no sort of questioning myself like why are you doing this this is not normal it was just you followed these rules and these behaviors that you were almost being dictated but like to um, and your focus was so clear of what you were doing that anything that tried to come in and disrupt you, you would take no notice of. And I often think this about those of us who go through eating disorders. Um, we are so determined and so <laughs> focused and like, stubborn as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's an incredible one to describe it. So stubborn. And I was like, we have these incredible traits which take you into the darkest place. But it's so ironic because they pull you straight, they pull you out of the darkest place as well when you use them in a different way. Um, And I've always loved to keep coming back to that um, because you can start sort of shaming some of those traits that you've had that pulled you into a dark place. But when you sit back and realize you're actually, hang on a minute, if I am dedicating myself to recovery, I know I'm a dedicated person because I took myself to the darkest place imaginable. So if I can do that, I can take myself to a better place. Um, And I often share that quite a lot, especially when you're speaking to people who may be in a really difficult place or they might have lost hope. Um, And I think it's really important to remind them of that because it shows that they do have strengths within them. Um, And it kind of flips it a little bit, you know, when you say like you've used these to take yourself to here, you can use them to get out. And it almost equips them with like this armor um, in that moment where they go, oh, I've actually got something here when they thought they had nothing. Yeah. And looking at your recovery journey, do you remember a point when you decided that you wanted to get better I mean we know that it takes long periods of time to recover from any eating disorder but 
was there a shift in behavior? Was there a shift in mindset? What made you decide that I don't want this anymore? I want something different for myself. Yeah, so um, I should probably just fill in a few of the blanks of the story to to get to that point. So um, I was a high-performing elite athlete um, and a couple of sports, cricket, but I was largely an endurance runner um, and I loved my running. Uh, I was put into outpatient treatment around the age of 14 and I always say to people, I was someone with a, I was functioning with an eating disorder during those years, the next few years, where um, I was adhering somewhat to treatment and I was functioning day to day, but I was still very much rigid and consumed by eating disorder thoughts, very controlling in behaviours and food choices. Um, but I was excelling with my running and I was doing incredibly well. Um, so we carried on. Um, and then I went to university when I was 18 to pursue my degree, but also um, to pursue my running career. And um, unfortunately, I was bullied. I was in the sports halls and I had a case of bullying. Um, and that was a trigger for a massive slip back. Um, and so I was pulled out of uni after six months. And I can honestly only describe to you the next couple of years two or three years were just, just existence. Like I was going downhill really fast and those years are just such a blur. Um, and sadly, when I was 22, um, I was admitted to an inpatient unit. Um, and upon admission, I wasn't adhering to the treatment. I didn't want to change. I didn't want them to interrupt my eating disorder. Um, obviously, they're trying to force feed you. You're resisting as much as you can. Uh, the tears, the arguments, the fights with the, the staff, um, it all happened. But within about, I'd probably say about two to three weeks in of my treatment in the inpatient unit, one morning I woke up. And I claim a miracle because I just don't even know how this happened. Like I woke up one morning and I just knew I was like, I can't do this anymore. And it was almost like somehow I managed to find my tiny little voice that was hidden in the back somewhere amongst this eating disorder that just managed to like peek out for a moment and say, no, this is enough. Um, and so from there, I started adhering to everything I had to do in the hospital. And I've always been very goal driven, I guess, from my sport. And so I had this target every week of how much I needed to gain to get a reward. And that reward might have been to see my family or to spend 20 minutes in the garden of the hospital. And I started responding to kind of these rewards. Um, and so it was after about six months. Um, was discharged from the inpatient and I went down to day patient so I could go back, live at home, but come in every day. Um, and the thing is, Ash, is I, when I was fully discharged from that, the hardest thing was I was in a body that appeared to look healthy. And I remember so many people who had seen me unwell in the village that I lived in, all these community that knew me praising me of how I was such a success and how I'd done so well with recovery and I felt a failure because in my mind nothing had changed and I think that's one of the hardest parts of recovery is when you live in a body that appears normal and nobody understands that you're still fighting in your head um, and it took me another couple of years. I, I merged into what is now termed orthorexia, where I became obsessive with, quotation marks, healthy eating um, and exercise. And I became obsessive about that, um, which was just another form of control to numb emotions that I didn't want to feel. Um, and... Where are we now? We're, I was 25 at that, 26 at that point. Um, and 
I broke down again and just I just I can't do this anymore. I'm missing out on my life. And I managed to find an incredible therapist back in the UK who was the first person who had ever brought to my mind the idea of this being about a young girl who didn't feel like she was worthy of love, belonging, acceptance. For me, that was alien, but it hit deep as soon as she said it. And that peeled off back everything and from there the I say like the real true parts of recovery happened I really started unraveling things I really started to explore myself my beliefs about things questioning things um and I remember one of the things she said to me was I got really tied up in image um body image was one that I'd really struggle with and so I would still maintain a lot of these controlling behaviors and she said to me, so what are you scared of? And I said, well, I'm scared of gaining more weight. And she was like, and why is that a problem? And my brain said, well, I won't be accepted. Like, I won't be loved if I'm in a bigger body. And she asked me, she said, do you have evidence to prove that? And I said, no. And she said, well, how do you know that? Like, how do you have like where have you formed this belief from um and yes I've formed it myself but I've largely formed it from the messaging that I've received from society that would make me believe this to be true um so recovery has been an ongoing journey from there I guess I've gone on a, a massive tangent to your question and your question was <laughs> at what point did I and decide that it was enough and it was that moment in the hospital where there was a turning point but I guess the reason I've gone on a, a big tangent is because whilst that was a turning point it was a turning point of one part of my recovery and I think along re our recovery journey we have these very pivotal moments which are incredibly meaningful in our recovery um, and that was one but then there were obviously some significant ones which happened much later and I think that's so important to mention. And I had to grab myself for a second because I'm like, I think I'm going to cry. Oh. Um, no, because I just resonate so much in the fact that, you know, we recover from, say, our eating disorder. But I, I honestly believe when we say we recover from our eating disorder, we recover from the symptoms of our eating disorder and choosing that as a method to cope. And then, as you said, there's a point where, where wherever you reach that, whenever you do, you have to really recover. Um, and I think that hit home for me because that had only really happened for me in the last six months of dealing with why I decided um, to use my eating disorder as a coping mechanism. And for me, that's still so raw. And I feel that, as you mentioned, recovery is not just this point where you just turn and all of a sudden it's like you're done, you're sweet. And even when you get to the point where you're able to go back out into society and um, society, sorry, and function without your ED voice taking over or being in full control. You still have to come home and deal with why you chose your eating disorder to cope in the first place. And if you never deal with that, if you never visit or decide to bring that little girl up or that little boy your eating disorder will always be there and it will always be something that you fall back on. I think that is so important to mention because I feel like I only learned that in the last six months, wondering why I, I kept having the ED voice still there and still so present, even though I wasn't actioning the things that it was saying in my head, but it was still so active in my life. And until you really, whether it's seek help or you start asking the questions yourself, I believe, as you said, recovery really can't begin. And I think that is such a beautiful process that you were able to recognise that and get to that stage. And I do really want to touch on that support, having a strong support network and how critical that is for recovery. And as you mentioned, you reached out and you were able to find someone that was extremely helpful but how important do you do you think support is in someone's recovery from an eating disorder? I think you can't do it on your own. And I remember um, when I was 
when I was admitted to the hospital, I kept saying to the psychiatrist, I can do this on my own. I don't need, I don't need help. I can do this on my own. Um, and I'm sat there saying this to a professional who's been in the space for how many years and has worked with so many and someone who was 22 with a severe eating disorder telling her she didn't need help. Um, I think it's critical. And um, I was in a very fortunate position that I had an incredibly loving family um, who stood by me despite everything that I did um and didn't lose hope and I think that was really important showing up every day and not trying to fix it not trying to be the solution but being there um and I think that's really important is knowing that you being there is being part of the solution as like a family member or a carer or loved one um showing up and just having that comfort there for that person when they're going through the dark, the darkest times. Um, but also I think the support network in terms of family and loved ones, and I know they do this by default, most people, they seek opportunities to learn about what their child or their loved one is experiencing um, because I think that equips them with at least some element of when my loved one is going through this, what are some of the things that I might be able to do or say that could be helpful? And they might not always work, but I think just having a few little things or ideas or skills that may be supportive. Um, and I also like this idea of not always focusing in on the eating disorder. So with a support network, I think it's really, especially in families, I think it's really important to still have activities which are normal, try to normalise as much as we can. Um, and I know if that's around food, that could become incredibly difficult. But even if it's one night the family sit down and watch something on the telly together or they watch a movie together and have this experience which is normalised, um, and that's progress in recovery in itself, um, having this connection time. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in looking for progress in terms of like the food milestones or the weight milestones or experiences that you've been super scared of exposing yourself to that we forget that actually sometimes the smallest things of being able to sit together um, without an argument or being able to sit together and experience some quality time is actually progress for someone experiencing an eating disorder. Um, so but in terms of like the professional support I think it goes without saying like these are complex mental illnesses and it's so important to seek help but as you know and as I know um, we have a system which can challenge that quite a bit in terms of accessing the right help um, and there are also something that I get concerned a little bit about as well is people who are out there who are offering help without having appropriate experience qualifications, which can be very triggering. And I experienced that myself back in the UK and um, was triggered tremendously by a, 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 work, well, a working professional who claimed to be a nutritionist in eating disorders. And um, I slipped back massively from that. So I believe support networks are really, really important but building the right ones is more important, which is hard. And it can take a long time of going through the wrong places mm -hmm. um, until you find the support that you need. And that's the, that's the really sad part. Um, and I wish I could just say that it's super simple and give out the names and get people to go and see them, but it's really not. And, um, yeah, yeah. Mm, and I think as well it's important that, as you mentioned, if you don't feel comfortable with your support network, whether that be someone in the professional space, that you don't give up. If if you don't feel comfortable with that psychologist or that psychiatrist or social worker, whoever that may be, go searching for someone else. It's It's not just it didn't work with that person, that's it, I'm not doing therapy, I'm never doing it again. I went through that many therapists until I found someone that I just felt comfortable with. And you have to find that because recovery is long and it is extensive and you have to be able 
to feel like you can open up and share everything because if you hold back in a therapy session, you're just not going to make progress and you're not going to get anywhere and you're still going to be in the same position years later or stuck in that quasi recovery as a lot of people say because you need to find someone that you feel comfortable enough in to be able to open up all the deepest, darkest secrets and get to that that raw and that cause because otherwise you're just not going to go anywhere. And I know it's so much easier to be like, oh, it didn't work out, but you have that strength within you and, and we have talked about that, that you have that fight. And if you have a goal that you want to get better and you don't want this to be your life, do not stop until you find it until you find your answers, until you find your team, your support network, they're going to help you get there till the end. Yeah, so right. And I find that even sometimes it comes up that people can struggle with family members that are not on board. What in your professional, in your personal, I know once again I'm very lucky to have a family that supported me throughout, Um But in your experience, can you provide any messages of support to those people that are trying to navigate conversations around families that may not be as supportive? Yeah, so, and I think that's a really important point you raise because not everyone does have that support from their family. And um, depending on how understanding people are to mental health, mental illness, their knowledge of that space, that can create a lot of barriers as well. Um, and conflict and argument. Um, and I'm not sure whether, where I have the answers for that at the moment, but I think the one for me is being vocal and really transparent about what it is you're feeling and what it is you're experiencing and detaching it from that person that they may know. Um, sharing that to let somebody inside the your mind I think is critically important. Um, And there will be times when some families just won't accept. And in those scenarios, maybe it's other support that's needed to be called upon. Maybe there are friendship circles. Maybe there are support networks that you have in the community that are outside of that family space. Um, Not everyone is going to have that positive family experience, but if you are in an environment where you are living with a family, whether that's your parents, your carers, um, I think being as vocal and honest about what it is you're experiencing, asking them to learn, directing them to resources where they might be able to understand a bit better about what it is you're experiencing. There is so much out there now in terms of just like resources to understand Um There are times when some people like go and experience therapy sessions together so parents can understand a bit better. Sometimes that really doesn't work. Sometimes it does. Um, As much as I don't want to say this, a lot of the time it's a trial and error. It's working out what works for you and your network because everyone really does have such a different experience in their recovery journey. And I think sometimes we paint this picture of like, this is recovery. Um, But as you know, and as I know, it's not that, you know, your experience, whilst we had similar journeys, would have like there have been so many things that would have been so different for your experience and your recovery to what mine was. And we relate on so many things, but there would be things where we go, oh, that didn't work for me, but it worked for you, you know. And so I want to be really transparent about that because um, I can't give the blueprint. Um, And I always wish I could, but there isn't one. And it's exploring and it's trying to work together. And as I said, the resources one, if there's no, if there's a barrier, pass it to them. Please read this. I need you to understand what I'm experiencing. Um, Yeah. I'm not Mm. sure if I answered that that well. No, I think it is difficult to answer as you said when we we both were lucky enough to have such great support networks um but I couldn't agree more it's communication and I feel that goes with anything in life if you just are open and honest and then you respond based on how they react with that if they're supportive and if they're trying 
And that's really all you can ask from them is if they're trying their best. If they're not, as you mentioned, I think it is best to look for support networks that are alternate. As you said, it could be friends, it could be partners, it could be work colleagues. You could find it in the randomness of places, but even support groups or, um, as we said, the, the medical profession, there could be someone out there that could really support you. And once again, just don't give up until you find that support network and it doesn't have to be family. Um, I think it's important to note as well, I know going through myself and having to mentor a lot of families and what we do here at The Secret Burden, that sometimes families go through a lot. Um, Caregivers go through a lot. We can talk a lot about our experience and how it has really affected us and our life and our environment, but can be really hard for the caregiver to also switch off. Um, Someone that has been supporting, say, a young person through an eating disorder and then see them go back out and maybe some sort of traits start to come back in that those characteristics start to come up again they see them losing weight or they see them maybe binging or purging how do you have that conversation when someone is of say adult age they're past the age of 18 the caregiver really has no way of stepping in anymore and how is that person supposed to bring that up how do you think you would want someone to bring that up and how should they go about potentially seeking support for that person that may be slipping? Yeah, the the change into adulthood is a really tricky space um, and I know that's something we really struggled with with me. Um, I think if there were any thoughts about how it could be potentially done differently, um, I think a word that just keeps coming back to me is this idea of empathy. Um, I think the attacking route is definitely not helpful in these scenarios. And I think we know that um, it's not a way to get someone to go to treatment. Um, I think a better way to approach it now is to explore with that person what's going on for them. Um, And so we remove this idea of just attacking the symptoms um, and encouraging them to eat, encourage them to to, to, to address their behaviours. I think we remove that and we pull that to the side and we go deeper and we ask them what's going on for them. We explore with them how they're feeling. Is there anything that's feeling overwhelming for you at the moment? Are there things in your life that you're finding difficult or challenging? Are there things that I can support you with? How is there ways that I can help you? And sometimes I think when we create this bigger picture for that person and we don't zoom in, there is an element where they're more likely to open up in in more of a, a subtle way, in more of a way where they don't become as aggressive, as defensive. Um, because they're being seen, they're being heard, and they're being listened to. Um, And that's something I've really sort of reflected on over the years um, and just in experiences that I've had. Um, In terms of helping that person to seek help, that's that's the really challenging part because you can lead a horse to water, right, Um, Mm -hmm. as they say, but... I think if we're having those conversations away from kind of the symptomology and really exploring the person as a whole, there potentially is an opportunity in that conversation when we've explored things, when we've explored what's going on for that person, their thoughts, their feelings, what's feeling overwhelming, to potentially plug a suggestion there about whether they would be open to exploring some support in that space. And I always like that wording as well because it's like it's not saying I think you should do this because that kind of I think I think it's a big no-no like we don't need the opinion of others what we need is do you think or would you be open to exploring this and so giving them this option I think you're more likely to get a positive outcome in that space rather than projecting your opinions and your thoughts about what someone should do. Um, 
So I think there's a way to do it. And I think the language we use and the space we do it in, the environment we have these conversations in, really thinking about that hard. And I know that's quite demanding like to say, oh, well, I want you to spend a long amount of time to prepare how you're going to do this. But even just thinking about where, where this person feels relaxed, where does this person go where they feel most at peace? Can we do it in a scenario like that? When are we going to have these conversations? Are we going to have them when somebody's come home from work and they're potentially stressed? Or are we going to have them when we know that they're in a slightly better space one day? And I think all of these things are really important to consider when we're going to have conversations, especially in, like you said, this this adult phase where you actually, if as a parent or a carer, you can't force that treatment. That is such great advice. Um, I think that you are so right in terms of creating that safe space and the language that we use. And sometimes it can be really challenging for a lot of people because a lot of people I know come to us often and are like, well, what do we say? What do we don't say? Are we supposed to talk about weight? Are we not supposed to be talking about weight? What are we supposed to bring up? And that confusion can really have people throw their hands in the air and then just try anything. But I think, yes, while it is confusing of what to say and what not to say, you do have to be careful because there is that really small window for that person to want to speak up and to ask for help. But I think the way that you said it and broke it down really simply, I think is critical and I think can really be useful. And I even look back on my own journey and even when you were speaking, I was like, oh yeah, I remember that time when mum brought that up and like I attacked and I was just like, I was coming home from work and it was often aggressive conversation. I'm like, oh yeah, that could definitely have been done a little differently. Yeah, but I think having the experience, it enables you to reflect more. And and I think this is why lived experience comes so valuable in this professional capacity now because you are able to reflect on things that happened or things that you did or things that were done to you or things that were said and really think, okay, actually, how could that have been done differently and led to a better outcome? Or how... Uh, and and it enables you to really think about future practice. Um, mm. Whereas I think if you haven't had that lived experience, you you don't know that space. Like you mm. don't know how that is interpreted or how um, it provokes different feelings based on your thoughts about somebody. Do you know? Like mm. I I'm, I'm, I think it's a really great step that we're now starting to see a lot more of things like what we're doing and lived experience being valued the lived experience voice being heard and seen and I know that this is the secret burden want that to be a big part of you guys is giving a voice to those who who need to to share their voice um and yeah I know it's something we're both really passionate about Mm, absolutely and I mean we both have been on our own journeys and have learned so much about not only who we are but the eating disorder itself and I feel that once you have come through recovery and you're in as as I mentioned like a rational mind where you now have a different perspective on an eating disorder I know I definitely have and I weirdly just know all the ins and outs and and know all the the tricks that come and go with it and you can quite clearly identify it Um, in other people and in yourself and it's amazing to have that skill and to know that much about yourself and and I only hope that people going through it can get to a place where they can really be so self-aware that it is actually a privilege to get to know yourself to get to know all your ugly to get to know all your your strengths And to really see that person and want that person to flourish. And I feel that that is a gift that once you recover from your eating disorder or continue to recover, that you get to discover every single day along that journey. And I find it very, very, very beautiful. Um, Whilst I've cried a lot, been chucked that many tantrums um, and still some days just hate it. It's also life and and it's, it's something that, you know, we, we've had to go through to become the people that we are today and it is a blessing to be to be sitting here and be able to to speak to you and share this story. So thank you so much. And, and I also want to put that back onto you. I mean, you mentioned a little bit that it all started with that little girl not feeling like she was enough. Um, 
for this world and not feeling validated. Do you still feel like she still feels that way? No, it's funny that you say that because um, so I don't, th- I don't think there's a finish line to recovery. Like I don't think that there's a time when you say, I crossed the finish line, I'm done. Um, and I think it's a show up every day kind of thing. And you do get to a point where you are, you experience, well, I don't, this is my experience. You experience things where you experience a moment, maybe you might be out and you're at a restaurant or something and you'll go to potentially your eyes might dive straight into what you would deem the healthy option. But you get to a point where you catch yourself and then you're strong enough to pull yourself out and go for something that you really want. And so when I say like there's no finish line, what I'm saying is you get to a place where life can be really, really good, but there will always be that tiny bit that will kind of sit there, but you're strong enough to override it. And so I don't really like to say like, oh, you're finished now or you're done now. And so in terms of the worth thing, um, it's a really interesting one because I always say to people, I know I know I'm worthy. I know that that little girl was and I am and always will be just by being here, by being me. But I think there's a real difference between knowing something and truly embodying something. Um, And sometimes I think subconsciously through behaviours I express, I may sometimes not be reflecting someone who sees her worth and it would just be small things like deeming that my work's not good enough or oh I I don't feel like I deserve this job or you know just these things where you still put yourself down that little bit because you still don't feel like you deserve it or you're worthy of it um might be a relationship or am I worthy of this love I'm not sure I'm worthy of it and so there's still this question mark where you know it, and I can stand here today and say to you, I know I am worthy, but there are behaviours that sometimes come out where I go, ah, but are you truly embodying this? And that's just part of exploring this journey, right? Like I don't berate myself for that. And um, I kind of like sometimes when people are like, you just got to love yourself. I'm like, yeah, you can say that, but it's not that easy. (laughs) I'm like, do you know what? I don't know if I'm ever going to get to that stage. I might get to the, oh, I accept myself. Um, but it's like you said, life's messy. And we've had this experience where it's, we've turned trauma into triumph, essentially. But the trauma, I think, yes, it will always be a, a bit of a wound that we carry with us in certain ways. We found a purpose. We found a passion from it, which um, I think is truly, like you said, a gift. But what I also think is we have we explore things on a depth that most people never even get to explore. And one of those when you mentioned was truly knowing yourself and truly going to those deep parts of who you are and why you do things and why you think things. Most people walk walk through life on the surface and they don't even ever get there. And so whilst um, people who experience eating disorders, we experience such trauma and it's so painful and it's so enduring and I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. There is that blessing that we actually, through recovery, get to experience something that most people won't ever get to experience in life. And I'm just like, well, that's something to be grateful for, no? absolutely there are so many times when I think why why do I have to be so self-aware like why do I have to process things so in depth but perspective when you step back and knowing what I know about myself in the so many different layers and I continue to turn up each day for that person that is a privilege and yes I can hate on my eating disorder experience and say it was the worst time of my life but I came out and I made it a gift. And I think if you were able to do that, then you're winning. 
you're winning even when you feel you're losing you're winning and sometimes you'll just catch yourself as you mentioned in small moments and simple things that even when you said when you go out and you you order and straight away your eyes fixate on the healthy thing but when you choose the other thing maybe not in the moment but I'll always I'll have this practice at the end of the day that I'll reflect on my day because I'm the type of person that I will just hone in on the negative and then the you're not good enough, you're not worthy thoughts will start to get in. So every night before I sleep, I hone in on the little things, not the big things because they're present, everybody deals with them, but on the little things that I missed and that were a true strength that I I forgot to realise in my life and and there is so many little moments and I feel like if you don't appreciate them and if you if you just skip by them, you will never actually see how you are winning at life by just turning up every day. And I feel like that is that's a gift. I love that. Mm. Yeah, it's um once again, once you go through recovery and you you open your mind up to so much in depth things, you just you just experiment and you try things because you, you know who you are, you know what you want. So you you kind of want to learn more. I know at least I did. Um, I wanted to know myself in and out so that I could, at the start, it was just cope in every worst situation. Um, I had a three thick layered plan of constructed. Obviously they don't always go to plan, but it's, yeah, it's beautiful. And just knowing who you are. Yeah. Now for everyone out there, um, who may want to find where you are or follow you or be able to go on this journey with you, where can they find you? Yeah, so mostly I am on Instagram. As I said, I'm pretty ad hoc with sharing. I have actually just recently gone on a little bit of a space where I'm not posting that much at the moment. Um, I had a bit of an overwhelming move to states, a new job and as you know, with an experience of an eating disorder that typically big changes um, can create a lot of anxiety for us. So I just felt in this time, I was like, I need to just pull away a little bit. Um, but it, my handle is Jens underscore little world. Um, and it really is just a space where I feel like I, I like to share my journey, my story, little things that are happening in my life that can bring some light to someone who might need it um, to prove to people that it can and does get better. Um, I didn't think it ever would, but it did and it does and it continues to do so. Um, so that's where I mostly share um, my work there. A lot of more of my professional work is across LinkedIn, um, which is just under my, my, my main name. So Jennifer Hamer, um, they're my main two platforms. I don't like to spread myself too far and wide <laughs> yeah no then you get stretched and that's like it's exhausting yeah <laughs> and then the last thing two things that I would like to put to you um hopefully I think someone will definitely get something out of this but what is your biggest lesson learned thus far and what would be your main message to someone that is currently going through an eating disorder oh great one no pressure yeah, I uh, didn't prepare for this one, Ash. <laughs> just, just I always say people chuck this sometimes to me at podcasts and I just go, first thing that comes into my head, I'm just going to go on a five-minute rant. So take the floor. <laughs> I think the biggest lesson is two words to, or three words, actually, I'm going to change. <laughs> I might change it to four. <laughs> I love that. Me too, and I'm now going to change it to four. I think this is better. Um, learn to let go. And I think um, I say that because especially those of us who have experienced an eating disorder, um, I think of all of our traits in terms of being high achievers, perfectionists, driven, motivated, dedicated, stubborn, all of these traits we try to control our way through so much of our life, um, which becomes such a problem for us in many ways. And I think the moment you put your hands up and you go, you know what? No, I'm letting go. Life will continue to happen and I will be okay. 
it's one of the scariest but one of the bravest things you can ever do and I think there's such a lesson in it because it applies to so much it's not just in recovery it applies to career prospects it reply applies to relationships sometimes the best thing you can do is to let go to be still create space and find clarity um I'm still working on this life lesson myself. <laughs> um, okay, and what I would want to say to people, was it say to people in recovery from an eating disorder? Yeah. Your job is to show up every day. That's your job. We place so much pressure on getting from A to B. I remember when I started recovery, I was like, I just need to know how to get to the finish line. How do I get there? What do I need to do? What's the what's the blueprint? Like I said earlier, where's the manual to recovery? Um, and learning that it's messy. There is no A to B. You're going to go down so many different paths. Some are going to take you forwards. It's going to be like a dance sometimes. You do like one step forwards, then you might go back a little bit or you need to take a different direction. Um, it's the messiest journey. But I think... Being able to just know that your job every day is to show up removes that pressure and you, by default, put yourself on the journey. You don't know where it's going, but you know you're showing up and you know you're showing up with strength, determination and courage because you know you're seeking recovery. You don't know what that looks like and that's not your journey to figure that out. It happens along the way. So it's not your job to figure it out. It happens along the journey. Um, so I really want people to just know that you show up and the more you do that, life rewards you and you keep doing it and you get more rewards. Um, and before you know it, you're living life like you deserve and um, and it does happen. So, I yeah, I just want people to know that it can and it does happen. I love that. The goosebumps. Because <laughs> it is. People need that proof. They need to know that there is. There is a light and there is a light for you. You've just, as you said, you just have to show up, put one foot in front of the other and strip it all back and just know your best is going to change every day. But as long as you turn up and do the best that you can in the capacity you have for that day, that is enough. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on the Secret Sunday session. I am so grateful to have you here and I just want you to know that you have come so far and you should be so proud of yourself and I hope you hold that space and that hope for yourself and that strength and gratitude and appreciation for you because your journey has been yes wild and messy but look at where you are today and it is a privilege to be on here virtually with you and be able to hear your story so thank you. Oh, Ash, thank you so much. And I echo all of that back to you. You are the most beautiful ray of sunshine that I think has ever walked this earth. So we are blessed to have you here um, and all the work you are doing. So thank you. It's been a wonderful opportunity. And as I said before we came on, you and me could probably chat for three hours, um, but we're probably going to lose our audience pretty soon. So um, we'll do that bit offline. Um, but thank yeah. you. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. No worries. Yes, this is definitely a dot, dot, dot afterwards episode. <laughs> so watch this space. Um, but thank you very much as well to everyone else for joining us today for another Secret Sunday session. As mentioned, you can catch Jen on her Instagram and LinkedIn where you can follow her journey and see some of her incredible insight into her recovery and continual journey um, walking alongside her eating disorder. So thank you so much, everybody, and we will catch you all next